Okay, well, um, welcome, good evening. Thank you, Ryan. That was a lovely introduction. Um, as uh, Ryan mentioned, I'm uh, Ted Sawyer. I'm the Director of Research and Education at Bullseye Glass. And um, a lot of people um, who are in the audience tonight already know something about Bullseye. But for those who don't, what I'm going to do is uh, take you through a little bit of a history of the company, some of the projects we've done working with uh, artists, architects, and designers. Um, and uh, then catch you up to some of the things we've been doing recently um, and how glass is used in uh, architecture and design. Now, many people are most familiar with Bullseye through the space we're in right now, uh, the Bullseye Gallery. Um, and in this space, we typically show works and projects made out of the materials that we make in our Southeast Portland factory that Ryan mentioned. Um, factory. Um, that's surprising to a lot of people, but yes, actually, Bullseye is primarily a factory um, or has been for most of its life, and it has uh, furnaces running around the clock at about 2,400 degrees, making all sorts of different types and colors of glasses. Um, it's also a series of resource centers. There's one in Santa Fe one in uh, the Bay Area in Emeryville, and one next to the factory. And this is a place where one can come and purchase materials and equipment, uh, as well as take workshops, learning how to make some of these things, uh, and attend lectures. The company was actually started in 1974 by three self-described hippie glassblowers, uh, including Ray Algren, who's in the back there, and Daniel Schwer in the front. And they were basically looking for a way to get rich so that they could support their glass habit and you know, be glass artists for the rest of their life. Well, things didn't quite work out that way. Um, but part of the reason that they were able to start the company at that time is that um, Oregon had just passed the country's first container deposit law, which meant that there was suddenly a lot of recyclable glass available on the market. And a lot of big manufacturers didn't think that it could actually be used. There was a lot of resistance to recycling back then. Um, but Bullseye figured out a way to use it, and subsequently, a lot of other people figured out how to use it as well. Bullseye's method was to simply take this recyclable material, crush it up, and add mineral colorants to it, and then melt it in furnaces, then pull it out of those same furnaces and roll it into sheets using a method that they were pretty sure they had invented. Um, and they subsequently discovered that the process was actually patented in France in 1688. So we're talking about Enlightenment era technology. Um, but it's still the way we make glass today. Um, and it allows us tremendous flexibility in a given workday to make lots of different colors and forms of glass. Um, I think we can make something like 66 different styles in quantity in a given day. Um, some of the forms of glass include um, things like rods of glass and threads and crushed up glasses called frits. Um, and most of it is used for what's known as kiln form glass, which is, in my opinion, exactly what it sounds like. Glass that's formed in a kiln, which might come out of the kiln looking like this, as opposed to blown glass, which we see here practiced in our factory by Dale Chihuly. From the very beginning, Bullseyes worked with artists, such as the German-born Klaus Moyer pictured here, as a primary mode of research in order to encourage the greatest technical and aesthetic advances in the field. And Moyer's work itself is an interesting microcosm of these advances, moving from modestly scaled, low-relief forms like this in 1984, and that's pretty much the scale of the work that you see on the screen, to more painterly works in 1989, to this work from 1996, which is about seven feet by seven feet, um, which immediately um, brings the work more into the realm of contemporary painting, both in uh, form and scale, as well as content. In 2007, Moyer brought his work to yet another level when he completed a set of uh, four six by four foot panels while working with our team at Bullseye for his 2008 retrospective at the Portland Art Museum. 
and here's a finished shot of the work without us standing in front of them. Um, while Moyer is an acknowledged master working with glass already, we also work with many artists and designers who don't have a background in glass, who normally work with other materials, such as the ceramist June Kaneko. And they've responded to the material by making works that are undeniably theirs in form and content without being a mere transcription of work in their normal media. Fortunately, many of them, such as the Italian uh, Maurizio Donzelli, have not been seduced into complacency by the inherent beauty of the material and remain capable of self-criticism. Over the years, the artists have begun to make larger and larger works, some of them becoming architectural both in purpose and scale. So it's no surprise that we began to do research work directly with architects as well. In 1999, we began a project that came to be called Multiplied Light, which culminated in a show at Bullseye in 2002. Portland architects were challenged by Randy Gragg to design chandeliers using kiln glass. Participants included, among others, Rick Patestio, who was greatly inspired by the inaugural show at Bullseye Gallery in this space of the Polish artist Anna Skibska, who makes flamework sculptures using threads of glass called stringers and strips of sheet glass that are welded together with a handheld torch. Um, her works are simultaneously delicate and forceful in appearance. Potestio did not use a torch, but rather worked with stringers in a kiln uh, producing swaths of material that he subsequently draped over um, molds and fired again before attaching them to a steel armature. James Harrison uh, kiln cast these pieces that look somewhat like truncated bombs. Uh, like many of the works in the projects, these do not rely on internal illumination and instead concentrate external light. When asked about why the piece was named as it was, the internal organs of Louis Daguerre, Harrison remarked that Daguerre, inventor of one of the earliest forms of photography, the daguerreotype, was such a fascinating person that his guts must have glowed. <laughs> Harrison has continued to work with the materials in public artworks, including this sculpture in the form of an antique fire hose nozzle in front of the fire station at about 50th and Sandy Boulevard in Portland. And it glows at night. DECA architects made this work in which uh, quasi-cylindrical units uh, were composed of two separate pieces with compound curves that fit together like this on the ends, a deceptively simple appearing but extremely difficult task to execute in the studio. The piece uh, currently hangs just up the street in the lobby of the Henry, for those who are not familiar with it. Greg Baldwin of ZGF used the opportunity to actually prototype a fixture that would ultimately be installed in the Everett Transit Station in Washington State. So here you see four of those fixtures hanging in that space. Um, and the other one, called number five, is actually hanging right over there above the table in the gallery. For those of you who've been here a lot, you probably look at it so often that you don't even notice it. Um, Thomas Hacker designed this rather intimate piece. It's about this big, even though it looks bigger uh, in the image, uh, composed of many strips of glass that have been tacked used together and then glued into a matrix. It actually has an internal light source, as does this piece, designed and executed largely by Kim Wilson of Holst Architecture. Finally, I'll show you this offering from Bora Architects, which is about the size of a Volkswagen microbus, and took the better part of an architecture firm, two engineering firms, a steel fabrication shop, a significant number of bullseye staff, and a team of lawyers to get it off the ground. Well, we enjoyed the process so much that we decided to do it again. Uh, in the previous project, we learned that we wanted a different type of design problem, and we also wanted more help. The design problem this time would be to create screens or room dividers 
in kiln glass. The help came in several forms, including the help of Bob Park of Columbia Wire and Iron, seen here on the left, responding to architect Swen Ho's idea for putting together her pieces, and he's trying to keep it realistic. Swen Ho also worked with another of our project partners, Ray Algren, one of Bullseye's original founders, who has a studio in town called Fire Art. Fire Art and several other kiln glass studios, Columbia Wire and Iron, and a then fledgling engineering firm named ABHT helped us move this project, which came to be called Between Us, from inception to completion in less than a year by far a faster trajectory than multiplied light, which took three years. Ho's ultimate solution to the design challenge, titled Sea Change, was a response to Randy Gregg's comment that architects are afraid of color. Obviously not. This piece is quite simple in design and execution and has been laminated for safety, which means that each panel is composed of two panels of kiln glass that have been bonded together with a resin so that if they're broken, they'll hold together instead of coming down in big shards and potentially hurting someone. This is a detail of how the glass is captured in the armature. A team at Allied Works, the firm that we all know and love in Portland that did the Museum of Art and Design in New York, pulled together this design in which all of the panels are actually composed entirely of clear glass. The change from transparency to opalescence is purely a function of bubble population. By using crushed glass powders in some areas, millions of bubbles are trapped. And these bubbles, in turn, trap light, working through different grain sizes of crushed glass called fret. Different bubble populations trap and transmit light differently. Jeffrey Lamb of Lamb Design Studios created this freestanding piece titled Sonic Landscape featuring extremely tight curves. This piece is also laminated for safety. Architect Gary Larson also wanted curves, though of a slightly gentler nature, for this freestanding S-curved screen, which was also laminated for safety and relied on very subtle coloration and the controlled trapping of grids of bubbles. Karen Nimi of YGH created this screen, which was based largely on the work of Irish interior designer Eileen Gray, formed of many components that fit into a simple framework of channels. And these are also laminated, though they don't really need to be. Eugene Sandoval of ZGF proposed this design, which featured a number of small tack-fused components and by tack views, I mean they were fired to a low temperature so the sheets were just tacked together as opposed to being fully fused to make a more homogeneous unit um, that would ultimately be held by custom designed fasteners and assembled on cabling, allowing the piece to take on many different configurations such as this curved installation from the show at Bullseye Gallery. The piece is now installed in the Indigo Building, which is just south of Burnside between 12th and 13th Avenues, so straight that way. Um, Colab Architecture made this screen, also using components, over 1,300 of them, that also hung on cables and could be moved around to space along a long snaking track. But instead of relying on custom fasteners, Colab designed the glass itself to have internal channels through which cabling could be strung. The screen was purchased by a private collector who had part of it installed at her residence uh, and donated the remaining portion to Portland State University. And then there's the work of Susan Emmons, who used with sheet glass and the four grain sizes of fret um, a method to make components for her freestanding screen, all of one color again, that addresses many of the, the fundamentals of the design problem. So it's mobile, it can serve as a room, designer, or a room divider or a space divider, um, and renders visible the space between two spaces by drawing us into the gap between the components. So it was a matter of time before all this speculative work um, in larger scale in architectural kiln glass would get the attention of a larger group of designers and developers. And one such developer, 
was Gerding Edlin, along with GBD Architects, who came to us in 2006 to discuss how they might incorporate kiln glass by local artists and designers into the Casey building right next door. One of the artists who executed projects for two areas of the building was a printmaker named Martha Van Schmidt, who's here tonight. I'd like to tell you a little bit about the process that she went through in making one of these projects, and later on maybe you can pick her brain about it too. Um, Van Schmidt was presented with an architectural drawing of the main lobby and asked to propose a design for four floor-to-ceiling backlit glass panels. Her response, which you see here incorporated into the elevation drawing, was a painterly evocation of the northern lights. The question was, could it be done in glass? And the answer, as you can see from uh, encaustic on the left and glass on the right, was yes. But these were only scale models, and the real pieces had to be 15 to 18 feet tall and 2 feet wide. So how was this done? Well, first you need a big kiln, like this one. And then while not totally necessary, it's helpful to have big sheets of glass on which to work. Finally, you need an artist that is up for the challenge. Oh, and a team of people to help that artist. Van Schmidt worked with colored glass powders to design her, or to apply her design directly to clear sheets of glass. And here you can see a cartoon under the glass. Um, that she's using as a guide. She used a fine tea strainer or sifter and then a paintbrush to manipulate colors in their unfired state. These large sheets of glass were then transferred painstakingly to a kiln which would then be closed and brought to temperatures of around 1480 degrees Fahrenheit after which the sheets would emerge looking like this. And while these pieces are firing in the kiln Van Schmidt would continue to work in the same method on other sheets of glass, which would go through the same firing process. Ultimately, three such layers would be stacked one on top of the other and fired together, creating a piece of greater physical and visual depth. So this is what all four panels looked like in the research and education studio at the Bullseye Factory. And this is what one such panel looked like when it was temporarily installed here at the gallery during a special exhibition about the Casey project titled Building Art. And here's what the completed panels installed in the lobby as seen from 12th Avenue look like at night. And so it'll be dark by the time you get out of here probably. So just walk down the street and go around the corner and have a look inside and you'll get to see them in their full glory. There were several other glass projects in the Casey uh, involving bullseye, including a series of backlit colored panels that are installed on the Everett side of the building, so right that way, that clearly identify the building as you come down the street at night, five of which you can see in this image when they were temporarily installed at Bullseye Gallery during building art, uh, but all of which you can see when you get out there tonight. Another artist whom we've worked with is internationally known ceramic sculptor June Kaneko, whose works are often so large that they require ladders to make it and trucks to move it. We've worked with Kaneko on many gallery destined projects since 1998, and he's developed a voice in glass that is irrefutably his in scale, composition, palette, and content that moves well beyond being a transcription of what he's done in ceramics and instead responds to the fundamental qualities of the material. He plays with the materials, <clears throat> the material's ability to be simultaneously transparent and opalescent and with proper engineering to appear to be flowing, employing a deceptive simplicity on a scale rarely achieved in glass, such as translucent angle at 85 and a half inches long. Of course, this kind of work looks fantastic in a gallery setting, but how does it stand up in other settings, such as the stunning Japanese gardens in Portland's Southwest Hills? Well, the answer, in my opinion at least, is quite well. Um, the work not only integrates well into the scale and sensibility of the place, but it takes on uh, different life in this context, changing with the light and allowing for more views, contexts, and approaches than possible in the gallery setting. And like many of the other artists we've worked with, 
Kaneko has made works with an architectural presence, including this curving wall that's roughly seven feet high and over 36 feet long. In 2006, he approached us with this design for Temple Harsh Lam in Park City, Utah, and contracted with us to execute the work in glass. It involved laying out over 150,000 colored threads of glass called stringers according to a line-by-line -line design specification, firing multiple small panels in the kiln before assembling them into larger panels according to the design and firing those to 1,500 degrees to make roughly 17 panels at 4 feet by 8 feet. These were assembled into a modified curtain wall system to create a piece that's 28 feet high, 24 feet wide, that sits just inside of the building's exterior glazing, as well as two sets of six side panels at roughly 16 feet high and 16 inches wide, half of which you can see in this image. In the last several years, there's actually been something of an explosion in the number of dividing walls and screens that we've done, including this piece titled Bloom, designed by artist Ellen George and translated into six panels nine feet high by an inch and a half thick, which divides the natural light-filled atrium restaurant at the Nines Hotel in Portland from the reception desk, providing both privacy and drama for both spaces. This screen here divides the waiting room from a nurse's station at the Oregon Health Sciences University Dermatology Clinic in the South Waterfront, providing a serene atmosphere for anxious patients, while also providing the nurse's station with privacy as well as partial views into the waiting room while creating a visually warm environment. Speaking of environments, one of the things that we're often asked is, can this kind of work be put out of doors? The answer is seen in this piece by Mindy Weissel, which is in the frost and hurricane prone state of Maryland, is yes. But it requires thoughtful engineering of the site, of the kiln glass, and the installation hardware. Another bold outdoor piece is this water feature at Baylor Medical Center in Dallas, Texas. It has 12 four inch thick components with challenging shapes that are required to make the water behave correctly and presented a lot of design and engineering challenges to install. Speaking of installation and engineering, you've got to feel pretty confident about what you're doing to make a glass staircase and stand on it. In this case, the basic design of the mounting and hardware uh, and tread module are bullseyes and the graphic elements which are incorporated into the tread are by the artist Michael Rogers, a professor of glass at the Rochester Institute of Technology. The treads are held aloft by wall-mounted steel tubing that fits into channels that have been kiln-formed directly into the treads. The basic design was one originally used to create a staircase that's mounted directly to a concrete wall in a private residence in Aspen, Colorado. Another staircase, this one in Dallas, Texas, features treads that have a gradation of gray that wraps from the front edge and fades towards the back of the tread. The detail also helps you appreciate the heavily textured surface that provides good slip resistance. Kiln glass can also be used to make furniture, such as this desk, here seen in action in Chicago in 2009, and this simple bench made mostly of clear glass, but which could just as easily have colored components either in limited areas or throughout the entire design. So ultimately the question is how can kiln glass be used in design and architecture? Well, it can be used to shape color and light and this piece is actually right here. So after the talk, go have a look at it, see it in the flesh. It can bring color and translucency into a wall it can energize a space or serve as wayfinding. It can divide a space. It can be walked on. It can be typed on. It can be sat on. And that's probably not the end. In fact, it's probably just the beginning. Are there any questions? 
Tom Jacobs is here with me tonight. He's pretty much the guy who made a lot of what you saw happen. So if you have technical questions or questions of a business nature regarding getting this kind of work made, he's the person to ask. Otherwise, that's all I have for you.